What's up, everybody? We're back. Nice. Scott, I agree. I'm seeing a lot of blue badges. I love it. I love it. Just got to get taped up here. Just got to get taped up. I believe it goes by rank. So I think it goes uh, white, blue, purple, brown, black, and then gold. I think is what I did. All from France. I love it. That's why I like Sundays. I get the Europeans in here. What's up, Papadakis? It's good to be back. I had a crazy, crazy busy week. Crazy busy. So much was going on. I just, I couldn't find the time to get here. I was working crazy hours. But we're back now. We're back. And after we get done with this live stuff, we're going to film some stuff uh, for the weekly YouTube content. So if you guys have any ideas, throw them in the comments below, shoot me an email, do whatever you got to do. From Costa Rica, what's up? Oh, from Quebec, nice. Got some Canadians in here. Thank you, Papadakis. What's up, Sasaki? Good to see you made it. Super sorry about last week, guys. I thought I canceled the live stream and all the posts, and I guess it slipped me. What's up, Scott from Liverpool? Whoa, South Africa. Wow. And we're going, we're going world. We're going world today. I love it. I love it. Yeah, I just got super busy. Super busy. You know, I was able to reopen up the gym this week to social distancing classes. So I had to get that all taken care of. I had to get the school up and running. So it, it took a little bit to do. Plus I had all the training. I had my work to do. I had a lot of stuff going on. I'm your favorite judo teacher. Nice. Nice. From Germany. What's up? Michigan. Nice. I don't know too many people from Michigan that do judo. Georgia. There we go. There we go. Puerto Rico. Nice. Nice. We're going to give it to about the five minute mark before we get started. No, not even close. Come on, Jolly. What? You think I am here? Look at him. He looks all upset about it. Look at him. He's upset because he had to leave the fishing boat to come to come do judo. He's a little upset about it. It's a nice day out here. From Germany, nice. Ann Arbor, Michigan. Okay. California. Whoa. West Coast. Netherlands. Nice. So for those of you guys who don't know, who are just here stumbling upon from YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, wherever it is you're from, I'm glad you think I'm a great judoka. Thank you. Raleigh, North Carolina. There you go. We're going to be going over some movement patterns. Okay. That way you guys can practice this at home. You don't need a dojo. You don't need anything. I taped up the floor here. And for those of you guys who are looking for something like this, uh, let me grab it here really quick while I'm taping my fingers. Here, Ryan, catch. Hold that up. There you go. So Fuji Mats came out with this tape that allows you to tape patterns and stuff to the tatami. So if you're a dojo owner looking to like maybe cordon off like for your students or you're doing what I'm doing here where I like, I like the clock look because it helps me learn angles and pay attention and give me targets that I need to hit, which for me increases learning and everything. But these are, this is like 12 bucks on fujimats.com. It's like a roll of duct tape, but it won't leave any residue on the mats. So you can put it down. We're going to be walking on it. We're going to be training on it. Okay. And it can stay down for, they told me like a month or two. So if you need to like coordinate off a place at the dojo, this will be great for it. Or if you want to lay out like a specific pattern, that you want to do, which is what you guys are going to see here today. You can put this down on your dojo and then come in five minutes early, maybe 10 minutes after class, and you can do some pattern work to help you practice how to off balance and create angles for judo. Um, and it won't damage the mats. So yeah, I think I put a link in the description. Um, I might have forgot. If I did, I apologize, but I think you can click on that. It's like 12 bucks. You guys should check it out. I'm going to use it for all my students. I just think it helps the visual learning, kind of like 
for those of you guys who watched the live, uh, what was it, the St. Nagy one where we put the belt on the ground and showed how to throw? Yeah, where that belt was on the ground. You guys thought that was super helpful. So hopefully you guys find this crazy diagram thing I got going on here super helpful. Nice, Simon. It is in the description. Great. Thank you for checking on that. But yeah, it ships worldwide, so check it out, guys. I don't know what colors it comes in. Um, they sent me white, which, you know, works out for my color scheme. So, yeah, we're at that five-minute mark. So let's go ahead and uh, get this show on the road. Here we go. Everyone wants a shout-out, myself included. I love it. <laughs> there you go. All right, so let's do this super basic, Ryan. Can we get our foot on the horizontal line here? Yeah. Okay, so Ryan is on the horizontal line, which is like we call the squared off stance, meaning his hips and everything are square to me. That way when I'm learning judo and I'm trying to do backwards and forwards throws, he's already in the plane of off balance, meaning if I give him a little push, he's got to take a step back to regain balance. Same thing, if I give him a little pull, he has to take a step and catch himself so that he can stay on balance. Now, when you're learning pattern work, it's important that your uke, Ryan here, does the exact same steps because what you're trying to train is your footwork and your hip motion and your ability to start learning how to pull with your body and your thighs, okay? Use the meat of your body to pull rather than just the arms. Okay, we want our arms to be the final touch to our judo. So basically, what you have going on is when you've figured out how to do basic, I gotta loosen up here, basic uchikomi, right? Basic uchikomi, one, two, three steps, and you figured out that portion of it, the next thing you wanna do is add movement to it, okay? So if I follow the line backwards, okay, and I push Ryan, I still want to be able to throw him forward and vice versa if I pull him off balance, I want to be able to turn and throw him forward all in the same motion, okay? But what I want to show you guys is how to create angles and I've been doing this with uh, our students all week and last week. Just trying to get them to understand that your footwork and your body positioning is super important, okay? And so what we're gonna do right now is we're just gonna go over a couple of, you know, I would call them beginner level um, angles that you guys can practice. Because everybody always hears, you should be able to throw at all the angles. So I should be able to throw straight back. I should be able to throw to the right. I should be able to throw horizontal. I should be able to throw to my back, left, center, and all the way around the clock and all the major angles, okay? You should be able to do that. But what people don't tell you is you should be able to do all of your throws at all of those angles as well, okay? So let's start with a basic one, okay? Remember the idea that I wanna find the square stance, okay? And remember, these guidelines aren't here as direct like we're gonna go down the line, but think of them more conceptually. So for example, if I bring Ryan to here, and then all I'm going to do is I'm going to practice penetrating. Penetrating. And then what I do is I use my hands to push that he steps. And then look, he's created an angle. Okay. And now remember, I always want to push and pull at the proper angle. So when I create that angle, boom, I can pull him down that line. And he stumbles right into my throat. Okay. So if we go back this way and we use that same thing. Boom, right at that angle, I push back up and I can get momentum going into my throw where I don't have to necessarily pull with my arms and my hands as much as you would think. A lot of intermediate, you know, even people on the world stage, they think of things in terms of, hey man, you just got to fire and go. But if you guys watched my Hashimoto breakdown, right? I think it was Hashimoto. Was it Hashimoto? I can't remember. The last one I did where he did that Uchimata, and I told you, hey man, his partner is sliding to his left into the throw, and you can see what he does in the very beginning where he shrugs his shoulders and he pushes off, and he gets that person following, and he catches them on the run, and that's what we're doing right here. Moriyama, thank you, big whoa, whoa. I knew I was wrong, but I went with it anyways. Believe in yourself. 
But Moriyama, yeah. So what we're doing is we're just training that action so that bang, boom, get him off balance, cut the corner. Super simple, super simple, right? Bang, push off, cut the angle. Okay, now another one that you can do, which is, that's the easy one. That's another like, just bare bones. But when you're a professional, you've got to speed up your judo, which means every step you take, your partner has to be able to take a step and you still have to be able to pull it off. It's kind of like chess in a way, as much as I hate that analogy. But look, right, if we go this way, sometimes we use the kochi, which I call a penetration step. We penetrate and we get him to open up so that when he does that, I can hit my back step. So by the time this foot, right, let's break this down into steps, okay? I make move one, he makes move two, I make move three, okay? So look, one, two, I'm into my throw, right? Super simple, but you have to make sure that you move slightly faster than your opponent if you want to get it to work. You make one step, boom, I'm already in position right? Boom, already in position so that I can throw. And if for whatever reason, my partner, right? When I go here, if I'm trying to back step, but he pulls my sleeve and it pulls my leg around, I can push off my front leg, take a step, pull him off balance again, and I can still throw him to the floor. Okay. Super, super simple concept. And that's, and that's going down this line right here. Okay. I'm glad you think I'm cool, Colin. Lewis, I'm glad you think the compass on the ground. I like to think of it as a clock, right? Where you guys are looking at 12 where the Fuji logo is. Six is where the camera is. Nine and three. And then we figure out the rest of them however you want to look at it, like an analog clock. But anyway, so that would be one angle, okay? Where I'm going to turn him that 90 degrees so I can get him down this line and I can take a shot, right? Super, super simple. Now, another one, another one would be how do we create an angle to the back corner? Because I want to be able to throw off in this corner too, right? But what a lot of people do to this corner is they make it complicated and they try to slide and they go, and then they try to figure it out and it's like, that doesn't work. It doesn't work. So what you wanna do, what you wanna do is you wanna play with the foot again. So on this side, what, nope, stand square. There you go. This side, remember what I did. I tried to get this foot to go back. That way I could pull him off at that angle, right? So what I'm gonna do is if I invert it, what I do, nope, stand square on the line. There you go. What I do is lefty righty, I flinch, I get him to step back, boom. I push off that front leg, same throw, same throw. Didn't change a thing except for the leg that I played with, okay? Because when he's a righty, go ready. When he's a righty, you might need to get him to step back, boom, throw. If he's a lefty, you might need to get him to step back, boom, push off, hit him with the throw, right? I'm not using my hand so much as much as I'm using the meat of my body, my chest, okay, and my footwork. I'm selling him on that ability. And it comes from the knee. A lot of people try to do this with the foot and they're like, ah, I'm just playing with it. But what you have to do is you have to use your knee motion in order to sell that and create that rhythm, okay? No, Pat, I would use the same philosophy because even if you're a heavyweight, go ahead and grab my neck, and you're like, you're like locked up like this, you would still use that same motion where you get him to step and you pull him, right? The problem is, is when you're a heavyweight, you have to use more timing and precision, okay? I refer to it as like a, like a hangman's grip, meaning you've got to be able to use your hands to keep the upper body okay, chest and shoulders up where they are while they move their lower body back. We talked about this in a previous live session, okay, I can't remember which one it was, 
That's why I put this stuff in DVDs and make you guys buy it so that it makes sense and it's organized. This is kind of like a free for all. But look, let's check this out. Go ahead and uh, put that foot forward. There we go. Nope, uh, both foot forward. Uh, the, this foot forward. There you go. Okay. Look, if I keep Ryan's head here and I ask him to take a step back towards the line, go ahead. There. See how he naturally wants to come forward? Go ahead and do it again. There. And now he's leaning on me, so if I move, he falls. That would be that idea of a hangman's grip. Okay? And your job is to move his feet and then hang him before he regains his balance. And what that would look like is this. So without yanking Ryan, okay, go ahead and put the right foot forward. What I'm going to do is, head up, head up, there you go. What I'm going to do is I'm going to do my penetration step. I'm not kicking his leg out of the way. I'm just stepping and I'm pressing with my body. See that? I'm pressing. Relax a little bit. There you go. Okay, when he goes to take a step back, I have a feel there. And see that little motion with my body, you can see him wanting to step back and then step forward right away. And that's when you create the off balance. It's very short. It's back to that whole snap the gi concept where it basically means like, hey, snap the gi, snap the gi, snap the gi into the off balance range, right? It's not just about, hey, snap the gi and yank him as hard as you can. That does nobody, nobody any good, right? So what you want to do, let's turn the angle a little bit, right foot forward. Big stance, big stance, big stance. There you go. What you want to do is you want to force him to step back. Boom. There. And see, I get him off balance. Boom. Get him off balance. Change the angle. And now he's following. And there's the coachy. Super simple. Because he has to take the step. The problem a lot of young judokas have is they don't play with the different angles enough in order to set up their throws. They just feel like, oh, I'm here, I have my grip, I should be able to just blast them and finish the, finish the fight. But that's not the case. That's why most judo matches don't end when they first get the grip, right? It takes a while and it takes a few chances and a couple of efforts with the throw in order to get it to work. Even with Moriyama, even with Abe, even with Ono, they don't throw usually on the first one. They have to set it up with movement Right? They have to set it up with movement in order to get their big throws to work. And that's what we're going over here today. Now look, we have two right now. We have two. We have this one, change the angle. Right? I have the back corner, boom, change the angle into the throw. But there's also a couple of others, okay? There's a couple of others. I'm not going to go full crazy on you guys and give you guys a hundred, just a couple. Okay, a big one for a lot of people is the slide. Okay, look it, look it, look at my shoulder, the slide. As you walk backwards, slide, back step. Now look, as Ryan and I, we're, we're going from nine to three for you guys, nine to three, horizontally. But look, as we walk, as we walk, I slide Ryan past. But notice that I'm still looking forward, okay? I'm using the dynamic range of my shoulders to pull Ryan. Because what I'm doing is if I stand here, I'm pulling. I'm not pulling. I'm not getting stuck here where I run into my own body, right? I'm not doing this. I'm getting stuck. My elbow is passing the line of my back, okay? So that I can pull past. When we're in this position right here, when I'm walking, what you want to practice is step and load, okay? Step and load, pull, back step, uchimata, okay? At the 45, okay? So if Ryan is standing here and we're doing this in one go, when I'm here and I pull him, I'm throwing him here, okay? at this angle, this line, okay? It's a big mistake and it's what a lot of people do is they don't practice throwing at the different angles. I'm not throwing Ryan in front of me. I'm not pulling him behind and then turning and throwing here. I'm throwing right at the corner. So when I'm here and I slide and pull, boom, right here, 
right into this white line, okay? You're throwing straight off at that angle with a slide and pull. So we're here, going straight back. When we walk, step and load, boom. At the 45, a slight turn of the hips. Back step, slight turn. Because you're using that right hand to bring him off at the angle. How do you... How do you do the opposite sided foot stab uchimata? You've briefly showed it before, but how do you set it up with movement? Nagi has a similar setup for uchimata, but in a circular motion. Yeah, EJ, same motion, same motion. Nagi no kata. One, two, a little bit more. Three, same motion. I'm just doing it while walking, pulling my shoulder. Okay, while walking, pulling my shoulder. Okay, so that's three for you. That's three. Again, let's review. Let's review. We have one. We change the angle. Boom. We attack. We have changed the angle. Boom. We push off. We attack. I have a, let's pull him off in the straight direction. Boom. Pull him past attack. Okay, there's three. Again, they're all playing off that off balance point. Brent with the super chat. Love it. I love her eye and I'm going nogi in jujitsu. And I've seen recently you don't like it for nogi. Should I rep more hours of a different takedown? or counter the roll via bottom side control submission I'm good at. Brent, the harai is okay, but use it as an off balance tool for no gi, okay? So if I have an overhook, for example, no, grab my back, there you go. If I have an overhook and I'm looking for harai, you wanna make sure you back step, okay? For no gi specifically, because what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna throw right to the Fuji logo, okay? Even though I'm looking right at you, we're thrown to the Fuji logo. As I walk back, push, pull, big turn. And then that right leg can block his leg. So from this angle, off to the side, I have that overhook. One, two, big step. And I can pull that foot forward. Now I can block and reap. And then if he steps over and around, boom, back up again, and then go front headlock. And then bring him down to the floor. Okay, so that's what I would be doing. I think I show that in my uh, Mastering Nogi Takedown video. I have almost no power on my shoulders when I want to lift my partner. Simon, you probably have no power because your arms and shoulders aren't loose enough. Okay? You want to be able... You're welcome, Brent. You want to be loose. Loose, and you want to lift the jacket, okay? You want to lift the jacket. A lot of people don't realize that the jacket is your most powerful weapon when doing takedowns. They forget about it. But the one thing you'll notice when you watch Japanese players do chikomis, right? Go to the IJF YouTube channel. Um, there's another guy like Judo Highlights. He just did a highlight video of me. He's got a cool YouTube channel where he does a lot of highlights. But he also shows a lot of people doing uchikomis in those highlights. Watch them. The one thing you will see in common is movement from the jacket. Okay? Movement from the jacket. Look, take a look at, turn the angle a little bit. Take a look at my uchimata, right? If I'm doing uchimata. Down, up. Look at how much space there is here in the jacket. Down, up. Down, up. Tile, open and close. Boom, open, close. Boom, open, close. Right? Say an Aggie. Open, close. Open, close. This is moving a ton because what happens is the jacket gets stuck in the armpit. So if I pull it, Ryan gets lifted up off the floor. What a lot of people try to do and they tense up in the shoulders and the back and the chest is they do this. They flex like this and they go, and they can't lift them. 
but you don't need to lift him. You need to lift the jacket because when you can get all the way through here, now he's on your hips. Now you can lift them no problem, right? New member, what's up, Z? Thank you for becoming a member. Love it. Oh, and everybody, that reminds me. I changed the URL to the website. It is now TravisStevensGrappling.com. Go check it out. So yeah, Simon, that's what's going to help that. But let's get back to this movement stuff. Let's get back to this movement stuff. Let's do a quick recap, quick recap. One, Koochi, push off, get him to follow, make an attack, right? Cut the angle to the back, boom, when he touches, push off, make an attack. He's already squared off, nope, nice and square. We push off, boom, pull him past, make an attack, okay? We got three so far. now. Let's take a look at another one. For this one, the most important thing that you have to do is make sure that your lead leg does not move, stays where it is. The next most important thing you have to do is you have to sell it with the head. What's up, D Sanders? Thank you for being a member, love it. I miss YouTube, guys. I miss everybody here, but let's check this out. So look, what we're going to do is I'm facing Ryan this way and I'm going to throw Ryan with Uchimata that way. And now what we do is we practice the figure eight. Think about the infinity symbol, how it sways. Okay. Down, up, down, up. Okay. And it's swaying back and forth and it never ends. Think about that symbol, that figure eight turn sideways symbol. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my big boy grip. I've outgripped my partner. I got his head down. My right foot stays here, okay? Actually, for reference, let's just back it up. I'll put it, I'll put it right here on that center point. And look where it is. It's facing in the direction I wanna throw. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna step up and I'm gonna crank Ryan down. I'm gonna crank him down. I'm the start of that infinity symbol, right? I'm gonna crank him down. And then what happens is, is when I step up, I look and I use my head against his head and I crank him down. Boom, 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 and I turn him. Okay, look, I'm looking this way. Now, with one step, I can back step, I can unload, and I can throw him back in the other direction. Okay? Super powerful movement for same-sided athletes. Okay, I'm a righty, Ryan's a righty, so it works out great. Oh, I'm glad you like the jacket concept. It'll help, man, if you have problems with your elbows and shoulders, shake the jacket. That's why you see all the Japanese guys kind of like, at the start of their uchikomis, they're getting ready to loosen up the jacket, okay, so that they can, they have motion in it. I remember talking to Neil Adams when I was young and I was in high school and he explained it like fencing. He's like, you always want to have motion, right? Like your jab and your move and your partner doesn't know where it's coming from, right? All the time. Yeah, Chris, it's a simple concept. People teach it all the time at the highest level, right? People always try to sell it. Sasai, boom, turn around. Oh, Soto, the only thing I'm doing is saying, hey man, you don't need two techniques, you can do it with one. Scott, thank you for the super chat. Scott, you've been missing the whole concept. We're all right on right. We're all right on right. So my favorite, my favorite setup for Uchimata, right on right, okay? It's getting this partner to be square, so one, nope, stand righty, stand righty. There, I pin his head down to my chest. I like fighting from an overhand grip. I just, it makes me feel strong and important, right? Just boom, crush him in, block his head position, get a good solid grip, jam it into his hip, right? I'm pressing it down into the floor. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut my angle. Boom, push, back step. Let's go this way. 
Now look guys, what, what I want you to pay attention to, Ryan and I are gonna do this super slow, okay? Cause I, again, I don't give you guys all the crazy little details. I give you guys broad strokes here so that you can go home and practice and then we can build on it. But I'm gonna give you guys a little bit of like drill down, okay, on, on footwork and making sure that you stand square to your partner. Now look, go ahead and split your body right down this line, Ryan, and then just start walking. Yep, just walk like a normal person. There you go, look at that. Straight down the line, right? His chest, go ahead, go back. His chest doesn't sway left to right, it goes nowhere. So if I'm following Ryan and we're walking, right? Let's go this foot first. One, two, three. And then I back step and try to throw him. Look how off I am, right? That's how people get their Uchimata countered and that's how Skashis happen because you're off center, okay? So look, when you're walking with your partner, practice this. And hey, put a line down the mat. I use belts when I teach kids at camps. Put a belt straight down the mat, split it between the legs. Look, when we walk, one, two, three. Now I'm gonna enter my throw, right? Check it out. One, two. My partner also moves closer to me, right? So let's go back. One, two, three. When I pivot, I'm inside my partner's legs and I'm square on. Because my foot crossed the line, cross the line, sweep down the line. Okay, and now look, when we go down this line, because I'm doing two things. I'm rotating square to my partner, so I'm square to my partner, right? But I'm also gonna close distance because my steps are shorter than his. Now look, when we walk, one, two, three. See that? I can meet him chest to chest when we take the steps. He takes a step. I take a step. And right here, my back foot, that's going to be the point of contact. So when he takes his next step, my chest doesn't go back. It stays in. Right? And I'm able to turn. So when I'm here, boom, I pivot. And he actually meets me. That's what amplifies that throw. Right? It's what amplifies your pull. If you pull too soon, right? if you pull, then rotate, you have nowhere to go. Right? I see a lot of people do this. All the people do this. They go, bang, big pull, miss the Uchimata. Because they can't turn their chest. You've got to rotate, then pull. But you have to make sure that when you rotate, right? just keep walking. Whatever you do, keep walking. One, two, three, four. Boom! right in line. He lands right onto my back and I'm able to pull and finish the throw, right? So super, super simple detail. Cross that step, back step. Some Japanese players, oh, I didn't mean to drill down on this, but we're going to drill down into it. Some Japanese players, right, when practicing their pull, specifically the pull, right, they also enter left, right where right now I'm entering right, left, right? They'll enter left, right. Specifically the Sayanagi type players, which we're not gonna talk about, but we are going over footwork, so I feel like I should throw it in there. So what they do, just wait, yeah. What they do is as their partner's walking, they open, okay? Open, that way, when this back leg comes in front, guess what? I'm square onto my partner. Same thing, let's go this way. Same thing here. When I'm walking, open, and then I can pull. You can see by bringing my hip and hand together, it's pulling my partner onto my back. And you can get very big, dynamic pulls to strengthen the shoulders and strengthen the core. Okay, so it doesn't matter which way you go. It just matters that you go one way or the other, okay? Travis, is Uchimata better from an over-the-back grip than traditional? Man, that's preference at that point. I think, personally, over-the-back is easier to learn for older adults than younger kids. Um, it just depends on where you started from and where you do your, your judo from, right? My judo, the way it puzzle pieces together, okay, when I was an athlete, 
I did all my Sayanagis from here. And then when I could steal the sleeve, I would do one-handed tayos and I would attack from the neck. I never really threw from here. And left on right, I would always play from over the top. I would break this down. I would climb his back because I know if I'm really close to him, he can't throw me with Uchimadas, Tayos, Drop Sayos as well as he could if I was over the top and he had this distance to work and move and move around and cut those angles, right? When I crush my partner in tight to me here, I basically remove his ability to create the angle because our hips are always stuck here. So no matter where Ryan goes, if I grab him by the belt, go ahead and go somewhere. We're always we're like a three-legged race, right? And that's what bringing people in from that high end. I had the strength to do it. So I could pull people in, I could crush them in. And then when they would try to get fancy with all those angle cuts, it didn't work as well. So the Japanese left on right kind of struggled with my style um, more so than the traditional grip. You're welcome, Scott. Yes, Chris, I did explain that backward step, saying Agi, my mastering saying Agi DD, because I think it's super important. It's also super important if you want to get good at Kochi, because like I said, when you're here, if I want to get good at Kochi, one, two, move that foot, right? Everybody tries to always move back in a way, but a lot of times, when you're in a position of trying saying agi, right? Nope, sleep. There you go. When you're in a position of trying saying agi, when you pull, boom, and you bring that foot back, one, two, you want to be able to cut that angle, right? And hit that skip set. Because coach is not always used to throw, it's used to off balance. Do you think an outside stepping Uchimata can be effective? Simon, do you mean. Do you mean me stepping outside his leg so that I can sweep here? Guys, I gotta shoot the other half of it. I've been super busy, super busy. But hopefully Ryan and I can start, you know, dwindling it down. I mean, I have the Ushimata portion done. I just gotta do the Harai and other portion done. And, you know, it takes like nine, 10 hours to do like half. Jolly, you mean this one, right? Just stand there. One, two, and then bring it in, right? Simon, yes, I do think it can be effective. Um, Chris, you're right, I am throwing excuses at you. I'm 100% I'm doing that, I'm not gonna lie. I'm, I'm doing that. I'm doing it. That, and I got super busy. My fault. Didn't prioritize my schedule. I apologize. I will get it done. I promise. I promise. It will come out. It'll come out. I'm glad you guys keep pressuring me to do it because I need, sometimes you need a little bit of push to get things done. Um, yeah. So Simon, it, it does, it does have its effect. I know Ono, uh, not the Ono that you guys are thinking of 73 kilos. I'm Takashi Ono, former 81, 90 kilo Japanese judo player, fifth at the Worlds. Um, he was back in my day from the 2008 era. Super solid judo player. Um, Nagase does it as well, where they'll be right on right. And what happens is, nope, extreme, there you go. What happens is, is when you're at this angle, his off balance point Let's scoot this way, see your center. Yeah, his off balance point when I turn is this direction towards the camera and to the very front. So what they do, what they do is they, they basically establish their grip and they one, two back step and they throw their weight and it turns a little bit into a can-can Uchimata. But again, it helps to find the angle, right? Because it's not a big lifting, throwing one. It's more of find that proper angle so that when you are here, one, two, out, hop, 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 find the angle, finish the throw, okay? Shaka, yes, having my hips close. Um, 
does make me more vulnerable, but it also reduces the power. Okay, when you're a technical judo player, right? When you're a tech, go stand square. There you go. Go ahead. Right there. When you're a technical judo player, you need to be able to move, right? That's why Japanese players are always moving. They're stabbing, they're fainting, they're moving, and then they're throwing, right? You need that motion because it's what amplifies your power, right? Turn around and then go ahead and walk, right? If me and Ryan are walking and I time it and I give him a little push, look how far he goes, right? Because he's already walking in that direction. Now turn around, just stand there. Whereas like if I give him that same push, he doesn't really go anywhere, right? So a Japanese player uses the momentum of Ryan walking and then I push him and then he goes further, right? I amplify the power in the direction that he's already going. Whereas a guy like me, when I'm fighting an opposite side of player, where I'm shutting it down and saying, hey, you're not really gonna move anywhere because I'm gonna hold you in place. So what I've done is, go ahead, no, turn around, start walking, is I've taken a guy that looks really strong, because look how far I pushed him. I pushed him six feet with almost no effort. If I get him to stand here, and I go like this, I actually moved away a little bit, right? Because he doesn't, like nothing really happens. So he doesn't have the same kind of power that he would normally have. And so yes, I am technically more vulnerable because he can get in, but he also doesn't have the same kind of strength and power because he's not developed that way as an athlete. I'm not saying you can't be thrown, right? It's not impossible. I'm just saying it's more difficult, okay? And because I use power, right? Where, Brian, go ahead and stand there. Turn around. Where I use power, right? I could stand here. And then when I push Ryan, because I have power, like I know how to get him to move. And I practice it. Therefore, I'm stronger and better at it than the guy that's more technical that uses more motion, right? It's just about stacking the playing field, right? If, I have a, if I'm fighting somebody who moves a lot and uses their feet, Right? A good example would be if you go watch the German uh, Dusseldorf Grand Prix final. I fought Sven Marish. Right? You can go to Judo Base and you can watch this. My whole game plan, because he's a Saint Agi player, he likes to shake the gi and get you chasing and gripping, and then he drops underneath you, and sure enough, you go over. So what we did was we said, okay, I'm going to walk out there, and I'm just going to stand in the center. All right? Every time he runs away, just stand here. He has to grab my gi and he's got to stand in front of me. And he struggled because every time he would grab my gi and I would grab him, he would start breaking grips and backing up. Break grips and back up. And then I would stand here. I wouldn't get into the battle of going break your grips and back up. I wouldn't get in this battle of feeling like I needed to get at him where I was chasing him where he could drop underneath me. Right? So it's just, it's just stacking the field. That's all, that's all we're doing. What's the best way to pull guard in a street fight? Get kicked in the nuts so that you have to sit on your butt and protect yourself. Um, I can't read your name because it looks Russian to me. Um, but what do I do when my knees hurt when I lift with honey? I'm not even sure how that's possible. I would go see a doctor. Super chat from Dorian Pulver. Is there no question? Thank you, Dorian. Thank you for the super chat. Love it. Although I wish there was a question I could answer, but that's okay. Uh, Wo Spear. I like a Ken Ken Uchimata. I think, it, I think it's super valuable. And I think it's something a lot of people should just try to learn because it's gonna help build those stabilizing muscles so that you can find that balance point, okay? I mean, if you get into a street fight, you deserve to get kicked in the nuts because you're an idiot. You're an egotistical prick. It's probably just a bad idea to be in a street fight anyways. So again, egotistical prick, you deserve to get kicked in the nuts. Find something better to do with your time. Big whoa, whoa. I'm glad you like that. Just give him a solid boot. Boop. 
But anyways, okay, so let's, let's go back to this grid thing. I got one more. I got one more that I wanna show you guys, okay? <laughs> Sikana, the best one, the best right versus right Ken Ken style would be to, um, again, you guys, that, that's why this clock is, is so important, this like, circle thing. So it's kind of, we're going to answer yours, that right versus right, um, scenario. So again, you want to be able to take one throw and throw it all the different angles. Okay. If you want to master the throw and you've got to be able to have different footworks and different setups and different styles of the throw in order to get it to pull off. Now look, can, can right versus right, get them to move. Boom. Turn that angle back step wide because you feel like he's running from you so that you can lift that leg, hop, 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 and then find the angle for the finish. Super simple. All you have to do, all you have to do is boom, lift, hop, 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 and then figure it out from there, okay? That's probably the easiest one to do for anybody. What other techniques do you like to use in combination with Uchimata? Uchimata sucks but I've had a lot of success with Uchimata Kochi combination. Um, I like Sumi. Sumi is always easy because it's the same footwork. Sell it with the head, come back, Sumi. Mark, thanks for being a new member. Air high five to you. Welcome to the team. Brent, my favorite setup from the over under, over under, is to Sai Komiyashi to Yamaashi Harai. What do you think is a high level competitor? Brent, can you be specific on which sport you're talking about and which style of over under? Because there's an over under where you're over on this side and there's an over under where you're over on this side. And then I'll get, I'll get to your question from there. But let's go back to this. Okay, so look. Chris, I'm glad you like the mastering Sumi Gaishi. Best throw in judo. Brings you down to the ground. Super hard to get a penalty for. Super hard to stop. And super easy to learn. Okay, but let's go back to this angle thing just to give you guys kind of like a glimpse of what we got going on. All we're going to try to do is move at all the different angles. So look, we're going to do this slowly. When I'm in this position, I'm going to get him to step back. Boom. I pull him off in this direction. As I do that, I do kochi. He slides, stumble back, boom. As he does that, look at that. You see how he hit this line? I change my angle, boom. I pull him back at this line. I pull him back, I fit in. I turn around down that same line, pull, sweep. Push him straight back, because that's the angle. Stop, pull back, boom, kochi right here to this angle, stop, pull him back, 180 degree turn, finish the throw, right? All you're trying to do is find those different angles so that you can do all of your judo while working on your feet and working on your hip motion. Because remember, we talked about how to create the angle and then I gave you guys a couple of different setups with the walking, pulling, right? Walking, pivoting, okay, walking, Kochi pushing him off to that back, attacking to that rear corner, right? All super, super good options. You said over, under, head on the overhook side, head on the overhook side, right? where you want to do sasai, or do you want to do sasai? Dorian, thank you for the super chat again. Ideally, the first one, the first one. So you want to do, you want to do sasai this way. 
right? So back your hips up, Ryan. Hug me, hug me. There you go. Okay. So look, if you're if you're looking to do sasai to this side, it's it's going to be a super a super difficult thing to actually finish and and throw with because this foot step forward, Ryan. Step forward and step back. There you go. Because he's too heavy. Leaning back onto that leg. Go ahead and lean back on that leg. It's he's just too heavy. Let's turn the corner. There. Cause that nope, just push into me. There. Even if he's pushing, it's once that that's like a counterweight back here for you. Okay? So you want to use the underhook. And again, back to the circle, guys. Back to the circle. You want to use the underhook to load it. So what I would do is I would turn the corner and forget the second throw. Forget it. 100 percent useless. Learn how to move so that you can get throw one. Cut the corner and pull that back leg forward. Boom. Now that he's forward, now I can hit him because that leg is light. It's not a counterweight anymore. I'm putting all of his weight here. So what I do is you just stay heavy. You block the hip. Okay. You turn him. Bang. And now that he's leaning, now you can block that and you can use that underhook to smash him to the ground. Okay, so you would basically turn, back step, and get him moving so that you can throw him with that sasai. You don't want to get into these like no nonsense, like I saw this at a fight to win just the other day, right? Boop, and then he pushed him over, and I was like, that doesn't work against real grapplers. Doesn't work. Can you talk more about the right angle of attack with Uchimata against extreme right stances of opponents? So I go over this in my... Uh, Mastering Osoto DVD, where you've got to learn how to disrupt the front leg. So if he's extreme right on right, uh, let's turn this way, extreme right on right, you cannot, it is very difficult, and I see some guys get away with it where they can turn that corner and throw, but the average person can't do that, okay? Can't do it. A German Olympic medalist from back in the 80s, when Nake used to combine right Uchimata and lefty Seo, what's your opinion? I mean, he's kind of an outlier, right? Because he's an Olympic medalist. Those guys are a little bit more uh, professional than the average Joe. But uh, let's go back to this guy's question, Ryan. Look, in, when you're extreme, the idea isn't how do I get all the way around? Because remember the steps. Every time you make a step, your partner gets to make a step, and then you get to make a step, and then they make a step. And at the end of the day, when it's step for step, you should still be able to throw. Okay? You should still be able to do that. Now look, when you're extreme, side to side, what I like to do is I like to touch Osoto. Touch it. That way, when you come up and you touch, he takes a step back. Now you can one, two, and enter in. Okay? And sometimes what that looks like, let's turn this way. What that looks like when you're here is you actually like fire it in. No, no, say this, say this, say this. You actually fire it in there and you're like, ah, okay. And then you, then the ref says, Mate, like somebody falls down, whatever it is. You come back later in the match and now you're here. So that now when you lift your leg, he automatically is like, I don't want to be in Osoto. And he takes a step back. You can put that foot down, enter, and then come in. Okay. All of that being said, you can also do, uh, I showed this one on my Instagram, a knee strike, okay? Inner knee strike. What you do is you step like you're doing Osoto and you knee him right on the inside of the thigh. Boom, one, two, and then you also enter into the throw. But you have to get him to make a step with that front leg to move it. Unless you're that much faster than your partner and you can cut the corner all the way around and then throw him which I am not. I am slow. I'm like super slow. I'm very slow. I'm very smart and I can cut different angles and I can protect myself, but I am not the fast guy. And I know that. But guys, we got to wrap it up here. We're hitting the hour mark. Okay. We got to leave some stuff in the bank to talk about in a future video. We will be back here Wednesday night, 8.30. I may start like five minutes late because I'll be wrapping up my jujitsu class here, but I'll be here, I promise. Just don't leave if I'm a couple minutes late, okay? Yes, Nastul does it from Poland all the time. It's a super successful thing. 
especially extreme stances. But thank you guys. Thanks everybody for showing up. Check out the new site. Make sure you subscribe to the email list so that I can send you guys emails and updates and Facebook messages and all that kind of garbage when I post new videos. All that stuff is all set up, ready to go. And also doing virtual one-on-one -on -one coaching calls for anybody that wants to sign up. Again, through Travis Stevens Grappling. And Ryan will show up. He doesn't know it yet. If you want to pay him to be here. I put it on as like a little extra charge. That way he can make some money. Because he does it for free right now. So help him out. Get some coaching done. Virtual style. Thank you everybody for showing up though. Until next time.